Machine Gun Kelly, an infamous American bootlegger, bank robber and kidnapper, who made the major headlines in the 1930s. But what made him this way? How did he earn his infamous nickname? And what led him to finally be captured by the law? George Machine Gun Kelly is probably considered one of the most infamous gangsters from the Prohibition era. Machine Gun was born George Kelly Barnes on July 18th, 1895, to a wealthy family living in Memphis. Kelly's early years as a child were essentially uneventful, and his family raised him in a traditional household. His first sign of trouble began when he enrolled into Mississippi State University to study agriculture in 1917. From the beginning, Kelly was considered a poor student, with his highest grade being a C+, awarded for his good physical hygiene. He was constantly in trouble with the faculty and spent much of his academic career attempting to work off the demerits that he had earned. It was during his time in university that Kelly met a young woman by the name of Janina Ramsey. Kelly quickly fell in love with Geneva and made an abrupt decision to quit school and to marry her. He fathered two children with Geneva and drove a cab to make ends meet. He worked long hours with little reward for his time. Kelly and Geneva were struggling financially as the job was failing to provide enough money to support their family. Kelly left his job with the cab company to seek another venue to make ends meet. The strain provided to be overwhelming. At 19 years of age, he found himself without steady work and separated from his wife. It was about this time when Kelly took up with a small time gangster and started a new venture as a bootlegger. Kelly began to enjoy the financial rewards of his new trade along with the notoriety. Along with the new success also came the quandaries of working in the underground. After being arrested on several occasions for illegal trafficking, Kelly decided to leave Memphis along with his new girlfriend and head west. He adopted the new alias of George R. Kelly to help preserve and respect the name of his upstanding family back home. By 1927, Kelly had already started to earn his reputation in the underground as a seasoned gangster, having weathered several arrests and serving various jail sentences. In 1929, he was caught smuggling liquor into an Indian reservation and was sentenced to three years at Leavenworth Penitentiary. After serving out another long sentence at the State Penitentiary in New Mexico, in 1929, for another similar conviction, Kelly gravitated to Oklahoma City, where he hooked up with a small-town bootlegger named Steve Anderson. Kelly soon fell for Anderson's attractive mistress, Catherine Thorne, a seasoned criminal in her own right. Thorne had come from a family of outlaws and had been arrested for various charges, ranging from robbery to prostitution. Thorne was twice divorced and her second husband had been a bootlegger, who had later been found shot to death under suspicious circumstances. The official determination of death was suicide, but many people had long suspected that Catherine was involved. Kelly and Catherine became inseparable and married in September of 1930. Up until his relationship with Thorne, Kelly had been a relatively small-time criminal. Catherine's influence soon became obvious, as Kelly's crime sprees would launch him prestigious statues of public enemy number one. Catherine purchased a machine gun for Kelly and pressured her husband to practice. It was said her purpose was premeditated. She was a master at marketing her husband to the underground circles and public. She was known to take the spent gun cartridges and pass them round to acquaintances at many of the underground drinking clubs, introducing them as the souvenirs from her husband, Machine Gun Kelly. Many historians and fellow inmates of Kelly believe that Catherine was the creator of the Machine Gun Kelly image and became known as the mastermind behind several of the successful small bank robberies. Kelly pulled off through Texas and Mississippi. In August of 1933, the FBI published wanted posters, describing Kelly as an expert machine gunner and created the public frenzy that would later place Kelly into the history books of crime. In July of 1933, Catherine and Kelly plotted the scheme to kidnap wealthy oil tycoon and businessman Charles Oskill. Kelly, carrying his trademark Tommy gun, and two other men carrying pistols, entered the Airshows mansion in Oklahoma City. The Airshows were playing a game of bridge with friends when Kelly stormed in and threatened to blow everyone's head off. Kelly's new hostages were now cooperative, and he was unable to determine which man was Herschel. The two men were forced into a sedan, covered with a tarp, and searched for identification. Once they found the ID on Herschel's friend, a man by the name of Walter Garrett, they robbed him of $51 and left him on the side of the road. Herschel was taken into hiding on a rural ranch in Texas, and the Kelly gang made demands for a $200,000 ransom. The Herschel's family friend, E. Patrick, made drop arrangements, and delivered the ransom in denominations of $20 bills. The money was delivered near the Lassell Hotel in Kansas City. The following day, Herschel was released to near Norman, Oklahoma. 
casually walked into the restaurant and called for a cab. Airshot was sharp and though blindfolded throughout his ordeal, made sure his fingerprints were swept everywhere. Counted his footsteps to various areas when blindfolded and audible sounds were mentally catalogued, all of which would later become useful in the FBI's investigation. After splitting the ransom money with their accomplices, Catherine and Machine Gun started state hopping, trying to stay two steps ahead of Lord officials. From the several clues that Herschel was able to provide, the FBI raided the ranch and made an arrest of one of the other conspirators. The bills that had been used for payment of the ransom had traceable serial records, and the Centre Bureau of Investigations started a nationwide search. George and Catherine bounced around different states with Chicago, becoming their main hub. They both dyed their hair to conceal their identities and enjoyed a lavish lifestyle. After several weeks in hiding, the couple finally made their way back to Memphis to stay with longtime friend John Titchener. On the morning of September 26, 1933, Memphis police, along with FBI agents, surrounded the Tinsa house. Kelly was found badly hung over the prior evening's drink bridge, still in his pajamas, and Catherine was still in bed, still asleep. The couple was quickly flown to Oklahoma where they stood trial and both received life sentences. Eventually, all of the accomplices were apprehended, and out of all those involved, six were issued life sentences. Kelly was transferred to Leavenworth in Kansas, and Catherine was transferred to a federal prison in Cincinnati. Kelly was arrogant towards prison officials, and bragged to the press that he would escape and break out his wife, and they would spend Christmas together. And in August 1934, Kelly along with his accomplice Alvin Bates and Harvin Bailey were transferred from Leavenworth by train to Alcatraz. Arriving on September 4th, 1934, at Alcatraz, Kelly was constantly boasting about several robberies and murders that he never committed. Although this was said to be an apparent point of frustration for several fellow prisoners, Warden Johnson considered him a model inmate. His life at Alcatraz was largely uneventful. He took a job as an altar boy in the prison chapel, worked in a laundry, held an administrative role in the industry's office, and generally served out his time quietly. Warden Johnson made statements that Kelly would become depressed when receiving mail from family members, but rarely failed to write his full quote of letters. He seemed to feel remorse for his crimes, and always felt that his wife Catherine and the other accomplices were treated too harshly. Inmate Willie Radke, who shared a cell next to Kelly on the second tier of B block, stated that he shared many fond memories getting to know him. Every day they would work side by side, having to adjure all of his big tales. But after his most favourite memory of sharing a cell next to Machine Gun Kelly, he said that nearly every night he would accuse Willie of snoring, reach out of his cell and slap him in the head with a magazine. Warden Johnson also stated that Kelly wrote several remorseful letters to Herschel, begging that he help plead his case. Herschel apparently never responded to any of Kelly's letters. Machine Gun Kelly was returned to Leavenworth in 1951 and died of a heart attack on July 18th, 1954. Ironically, it was his 19th birthday. Catherine was released from prison in 1959 and took a job at an Oklahoma hospital as a bookkeeper. Machine Gun Kelly and his infamous crime spree, although short, will be remembered throughout crime history, and Kelly has earned the reputation as one of the most dangerous criminals throughout American history.